Well, today, Donald Trump had a very bad day in the United States Supreme Court at the very same hour when he was having a very bad day in a federal appeals court, which came two hours after he had a truly desperate day in the federal district court of the single most out of control Trump judge in America. We begin with Donald Trump's big loss in the United States Supreme Court before turning to what is likely to be an even more important loss in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals that could send Donald Trump on his way to being criminal defendant Donald Trump, accused of stealing government documents. Today, the United States Supreme Court simply refused to hear Donald Trump's final appeal of a court order requiring the Internal Revenue Service to actually follow the clearly written law that says the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee has the legal right to obtain a copy of anyone's tax returns. House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Richard Neal demanded Donald Trump's tax returns three years ago from the Internal Revenue Service and the Trump appointed Internal Revenue Service Director along with the Trump appointed Secretary of Treasury at the time refused to obey the law and hand over those tax returns for the first time in the history of that law. Chairman Neal went to court and it took, as one member of the Ways and Means Committee pointed out today, 1,329 days to get a very simple law enforced in America because Congress was asking that law be enforced against Donald Trump. A Trump appointed judge named Trevor McFadden disgraced himself forever by doing everything he possibly could to delay the case of the Trump tax returns, including not ruling on it for over a year or making any statement about it at all. Trevor McFadden just sat on the case, hoping it would go away if Republicans won control of the House of Representatives back in 2020, which did not happen. And eventually, Trevor McFadden was forced to reach the only opinion he could legally reach which is that the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee has a legal right to a copy of anyone's tax returns at any time. Then Donald Trump appealed that ruling to the Circuit Court of Appeals, which eventually ruled the same way after reading that very simple law. And then Donald Trump appealed that ruling to the United States Supreme Court. All of that, even moving at a slow pace, could have taken only nine months or less. But the Trump judge, Trevor McFadden, made sure he personally made sure that it took three years. And so the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Richard Neal, will have Donald Trump's tax returns any day now. He should have had them three years ago. The chairman of the Ways and Means Committee has a legal right to make those tax returns public because Republicans are going to be taking control of the House Ways and Means Committee in January. Richard Neal will no longer be chairman then and will then have no control over the Trump tax returns. But there's no need for Chairman Neal to make a rushed decision now about what to do with Donald Trump's tax returns, because the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, which is the Senate's tax writing committee, has exactly the same authority that the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, the House Tax Writing Committee, has over these tax returns. The very same law gives Senate Finance Committee Chairman Ron Wyden the right to immediately demand his own copy of Donald Trump's tax returns. And those should be delivered to him now, immediately, now that the United States Supreme Court has fully upheld the very simple federal law that grants the chairs of the tax writing committees in the House and the Senate the right to obtain a copy of anyone's tax returns, including Donald Trump's. The Senate Finance Committee has exactly the same legislative interest in those tax returns. Chairman Neal said that he wanted the tax returns so that he can check whether the automatic auditing of presidential tax returns is working the way it is supposed to or whether Donald Trump corrupted the automatic auditing of presidential tax returns. Perhaps we need a new law written in the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee about automatic auditing of presidential tax returns. Senate Finance Committee Chairman Ron Wyden should send his legal request for Donald Trump's tax returns to the IRS first thing tomorrow morning at the latest, 
and the IRS, according to the Supreme Court today, should deliver those tax returns tomorrow afternoon. It was this afternoon at 2 o'clock in Atlanta when the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals heard oral arguments on the Justice Department's appeal of the assignment of a so-called special master to evaluate the government documents seized by the FBI with a search warrant at Donald Trump's Florida residence. If you spent the rest of your life listening to appeals court arguments at any level in any state or federal court of appeals, you might never hear a more one-sided session than the 40-minute session or so that was held in Atlanta today. Three judge panel heard the case. Two of the judges were appointed by Donald Trump, the other by George W. Bush. So all Republican appointees to this appeals court, each of them relentlessly challenged Donald Trump's lawyer, and none of them challenged the Justice Department's lawyer, arguing that it was a mistake for a Florida federal district court judge to appoint a special master in the case, and that that order should be reversed. Each judge wanted to know the same thing. Was there any precedent for appointing a special master to interfere with the evidence obtained by an FBI search warrant? Is there any precedent for exercising equitable jurisdiction in a pre-indictment scenario where there's no showing that the seizure itself was unlawful. We have been unable to find a case in which that, uh, that has happened, Your Honor, and I don't think plaintiff has identified one in his briefs either. And in a way that makes sense because Rule 41 is, you know, is a rule of federal criminal procedure, and so the natural place to raise that would be in some kind of criminal proceeding. Search warrants are contested by criminal defense lawyers all the time in criminal trials and in pretrial motion, motions in criminal cases. There is no criminal case yet about the government documents seized at Donald Trump's home. If Donald Trump or anyone else is charged with a crime involving those documents, their, their lawyers will no doubt try in some way to suppress the evidence obtained with that search warrant, claiming that the search warrant was somehow unlawful. But we are not there yet. Has there ever been an exercise of this kind of jurisdiction where there's no showing that the seizure itself was unlawful? Uh, not to my knowledge. We've been unable to find a case. The plaintiff has not cited a case, and I, and I think that's a pretty good indication that perhaps no such case exists. The proper way, the proper remedy at law would be in the criminal proceeding to file a motion to suppress, uh, file a motion for uh, use and, you know, derivative use suppression of, of the evidence through the poison stream. And then it was Donald Trump's lawyer's turn. I agree with the court's premise that there's not case law. I would start with the broader premise, which is there's also not a situation in the history of this country where a sitting president authorized a raid of a presidential candidate's home. So we have some initial do context. That, do you think that raid is the right term for execution of a warrant? Or execution of a warrant. That's fine, Your Honor. I apologize for using a, a more uh, a loaded term. It kept coming back to this. It seems to me the entire premise of the exercise of this extraordinary kind of jurisdiction would be that the seizure itself is unlawful. And if you, if you can't establish that, then what are we doing here? The judges kept asking, asking if this never before seen process of a special master should be given to every person who is subject to a search warrant. Are there any arguments that would be different than any defendant who, or any target of a warrant who wished to challenge a warrant before an indictment? Your Honor, what I would say is that we're, we're not looking for special treatment for President Trump. And then Donald Trump's lawyer went on to ask for special treatment for Donald Trump. This is a situation where a political rival has been subjected to a search warrant where thousands of personal materials have been taken. We, we can't ignore that in the context of equity, which considers certain things, such as the impact on the community when it comes to their view of the criminal justice system. 
And again, it, it ignores, I understand as an endpoint, it's a concern. We don't want to open up floodgates. The problem is you know, the, the search warrant was for classified documents and boxes and, doc and other items that are intermingled with that. I don't think it's necessarily the fault of the government if, if someone has intermingled classified documents in all kinds of other personal property. The classified documents were found in Donald Trump's desk. The Justice Department made the point that the special master process could go on as long as it took Chairman Richard Neal to get Donald Trump's tax returns. First, as to the timeline and delay, I just want to make clear that, yes, we, Judge Deary should be issuing his, his final recommendation in the middle of next month, but of course then parties will lodge objections before the district court. Presumably there'll be more briefing on that, you know, perhaps an argument and a decision. And then, of course, I assume the agreed party would have a strong incentive to appeal to this court, and then we'll be right back here. But that could take many, many months. And I, I can't do better than Justice Frankfurter in Cobbledick, in which he said, you know, delay is fatal to the vindication of the criminal law. And I think that applies in spades over here. Two hours before that argument began in the federal appeals court in Atlanta today, the Trump lawyers went to their favorite judge in America, Judge Aileen Mercedes Cannon, who violated every known legal principle when she appointed a special master in the case. And the Trump lawyers asked Judge Cannon to unseal a fully unredacted version of the FBI affidavit that was used to obtain the search warrant in the case. Now, that affidavit is filled with confidential information and confidential sources who prosecutors do not want to reveal to Donald Trump at this time. If Donald Trump goes to trial as a criminal defendant in this case, he will get a full copy of that. Every ruling that Judge Cannon has made that the Justice Department has already appealed to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals has been overruled by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Tonight, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals seems on the verge of overruling her order for a special master and removing her from the case. And so today's filing by the Trump lawyers with that out of control judge will not go unnoticed by a federal appeals court that is already worried about what she has done in this case and can only help speed up the 11th Circuit's resolve to rule on the case that it heard today with the knowledge that delay is fatal to the vindication of the criminal law. The, princi the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation is asking the United States government to fulfill a promise made to the tribe 187 years ago. This morning, we'll examine a promise made to the Cherokee Nation. In the Treaty of New Echota, 1835, this was the agreement that directly led to the deaths of thousands of Cherokees on the Trail of Tears. In this treaty, the Cherokee Nation conveyed the entirety of our lands east of the Mississippi. In exchange, the government of the United States made certain promises. One of those promises was that it is, quote, stipulated that the Cherokee Nation shall be entitled to a delegate in the House of Representatives. Like every treaty the United States made with tribal nations, the United States government violated that treaty and never accepted a representative of the Cherokee Nation into the House of Representatives. That same treaty forced an estimated 16,000 Cherokee to abandon their land in the south and embark on that treacherous 1,200-mile journey to what is now Oklahoma. About 4,000 Cherokee died on that Trail of Tears. In 2019, the Cherokee Nation chose Kimberly Teehee as the tribe's delegate to the House of Representatives. She's a former advisor to President Obama on Native American affairs. Kimberly Teehee would join other delegates in the House of Representatives from Guam and the Virgin Islands. But the House of Representatives must vote to accept her, which the House has refused to do in the three years since the Cherokee Nation submitted her name to the House of Representatives. Joining us now is Kimberly Teehee, Cherokee Nation 
delegate designate to the House of Representatives. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. What do you think it will take for you to be voted into the House of Representatives by the House of Representatives? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Lawrence. I appreciate it. Just last week, the House Rules Committee had a hearing and that's what we've been asking for all along, but that's not enough. We need a vote. And so we're hoping to get a vote in the House of Representatives this year. Uh, Speaker Pelosi says that she supports this. The House Rules Committee chairman seems to be saying that he supports it. I don't understand why it would have taken so long. Uh, the, the only distinction that a delegate has in the House is you don't get to vote. Uh, you can be members of a committee. As you know, uh, you can ask questions in hearings. You can uh, write legislation, co-write legislation with others. Uh, but uh, what is the, I just don't understand what the problem would be in adding another delegate, and especially a delegate who has been owed this seat for 187 years. Well, certainly the House Rules Committee members thought the same thing. I think we came out of that hearing with a very positive appreciation for what their job is in considering this proposal, but also uh, we were um, very inspired by the fact that they seem to embrace this treaty right. What it takes is the House to vote on it. Simply, that's it, a straight up and down vote. And so, you know, we believe that our delegate would be treated similarly as U.S. territory delegates, which you just described, and the authorities that they do have. Um, the only difference between the delegate and the, and the representatives of the House is that vote for final passage. What would you want to be uh representing in the House of Representatives, what do you think the House uh, needs needs you to bring their, the attention to? Well, for far too long, you know, Indian tribes have not had as many champions. You know, we have few and they are dynamic. Uh, so this treaty right would give us another seat at the table uh, whenever formulating policies and laws that impact us. But our priorities are similar to other tribes across the country. That's why they support seating Cherokee Nation's delegate. So addressing infrastructure, uh, housing, health care, public safety, but also uniquely supporting things that speak to our culture and who we are uniquely, such as protecting our native language.